Good morning, everyone. I hate to inter interrupt the conversation. It seems like the coffee has definitely kicked in. All of a sudden, you guys uh, are awake out there and alive. That is good. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Petrilli, uh, the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, and it is so great to see so many friends and colleagues here today. Uh, I especially appreciate all of you for coming in this beautiful Washington weather that we're having today. Uh, I know that was no small feat. Now, I have heard from several of you that because we advertise this as something of a coming out party for me, that you expect some kind of dancing at some point. And uh, we'll see, maybe at the reception uh, later today, uh, if we get that far. Uh, we, uh, we don't do these kinds of big conferences very often at Fordham, and again, just want to thank you for carving out a whole day to be here with us and talk about this incredibly important issue uh, and, and to dig into some tough questions. Uh, first of all, a little bit about Fordham. For those of you that aren't too familiar with us, we are one of the nation's leading education policy think tanks. We also do work on the ground in the great state of Ohio. Thomas B. Fordham was from Dayton, and we have an office in Dayton where we, uh, among other things, authorize charter schools. Uh, so we oversee 11 charter schools in the state of Ohio. Uh, we also have an office in Columbus that works to promote education reform uh, as an advocacy organization. So we wear lots of hats at Fordham. Uh, and uh, we, I've been interested in this issue both from a policy perspective and also on the ground. Uh, when we do our work in Dayton, Ohio, a city that is a lot like a, a mini Detroit, a city that's been through all kinds of huge challenges economically, and we think about how can we best help the kids growing up in Dayton uh, to transcend the poverty that they're growing up in and have a shot at making it to the middle class, these are the kind of questions that we've been asking. Uh, and and we're hoping that this conference and also the papers that are being presented today will provide a lot of good information to people in the Dayton, Ohio's of the country who are trying to figure out on the ground how to solve these problems uh, for kids. So today is gonna be one of these rare chances in education reform when we get to step back a little bit from the day-to-day -day debates that we know can often be so heated and vitriolic uh, and trying to ask ourselves whether the path that we're on uh, is the right path, uh, whether the theory of action that we have in our education reform efforts still makes sense, uh, and particularly with this question of how can we best help kids in America who are growing up in poverty and help them to enter the middle class as adults, and in particular, what role schools can play. Now, this isn't a new question, of course. Uh, we are now celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act is, is coming up. When he signed that act, President Johnson uh, said, quote, as a son of a tenant farmer, I know that education is the only valid passport from poverty, All right? Uh, just two weeks ago here in Washington, Jeb Bush said, quoting Horace Mann, I understand, that, quote, education is the great equalizer, All right? So we have, we're all familiar with this, right? We hear this at education conferences all the time. Uh, the, the problem is, what's also happening in America today is that we have this nagging concern that's really going across the ideological spectrum, left to right, Democrats and Republicans, that something has gone amiss with the American dream and that, that upward mobility has stalled. Uh, Pete Weiner, who's a, a great uh, writer, uh, center-right writer here in Washington, says, two-thirds of Americans now believe it will be harder for them to achieve the American dream than it was for their parents, and three-quarters believe it will be harder still for their children and grandchildren. Uh, and we look at the numbers. Richard Reeves over at Brookings has done a lot of great work on, on this question of social mobility. And he says, children born on the bottom rung have a four in 10 chance of remaining stuck there in adulthood. Okay, so, and, and we see this internationally too, that when you compare the US to countries in Europe and some of the countries in Asia, uh, you, you have this, this worry that we used to pride ourselves on being the country of opportunity where people could, you know, we were a classless society. People could grow up poor and they could uh, go rags to riches. And yet, in many respects, when you look at the different measures, we are now lagging other countries when it comes to upward mobility. Other countries in Europe are doing a better job than we are helping poor kids grow up to be middle class. Now, there's no doubt that education and opportunity are tightly joined, and we also see studies all the time, and we're going to talk about a lot of them today, about how uh, skills uh, are being rewarded in this economy. People who have high levels of skills, who have uh, a lot of education, tend to be doing still pretty well. Those who do not have those skills, though, are suffering mightily. So we all agree. We say, okay, then expanding educational achievement is a clear route to expanding economic opportunity. 
But a lot of times the public discourse ends there, right? Especially among the, the politicians and the policymakers, they make that claim and then they go on to promote whatever idea it is that they're promoting, right? And therefore we need school choice and therefore we need common core and therefore dot, 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 right? We don't often ask the question though, what kind of education do we need? What kind of education is gonna most help young kids who are growing up in poverty to get to the middle class? Is the goal, for example, college for all? Right, we hear a lot of talk about that. Just a few weeks ago when the administration came out with their ESEA waiver renewal plan, uh, Secretary Duncan says something like, you know, our goal is for all students to be college and career ready, for example, right? And uh, the president has this goal of dramatically increasing the number of kids graduating from college. So is it college for all? Uh, what do we mean by college? Do we mean four-year degrees or two-year degrees okay? Are post-secondary credentials okay? But even that, is that too narrow an objective? Is it realistic, right? Uh, we're still getting, what, about a third of kids through degrees? Are we really, does it even make sense to try to get to 50%, much less 100%? And, and, uh, and, and if whatever that goal is that we're aiming for, what does that mean for the rest of the K-12 system? Is it right that we are focused predominantly on academic skills, on reading and math skills? Should we be more worried these days about non-cognitive skills uh, that are getting more uh, attention lately? Should technical education make a comeback? Uh, after all, we're talking about college and career ready, but we haven't paid a whole lot of attention to the career part of that. But what does that mean? What does the career part mean? What does it mean to be career ready? Uh, what about apprenticeships? What about the military? And what can we learn from the military about working with disadvantaged youth? So looking into all these questions is what we're after here today. Uh, and, and with the thought in mind that the real goal of the education reform movement isn't student achievement per se, the real goal is the kind of long-term student outcomes, particularly for poor kids, that means helping poor kids grow up not to be poor, right? That's what so many of us are working so hard to do, uh, and that's what we're about today. Now, to be clear, schools we know are not the only institutions uh, that have the job of working on this question of upward mobility. We've had this debate for years now between the education reform crowd on one hand and the fixed poverty crowd on the other hand. And like a lot of our debates in education is pretty silly, right? Of course schools cannot do it all by themselves, right? At the same time, of course schools could be doing a better job of what is their job, right? And today, because this is a conference run by an education think tank and for mostly an education crowd, we're gonna mostly focus on what the education system can do pre-K uh, through higher ed. That is not to say that those other issues don't matter, right? Uh, I've gotten very interested personally in issues like the earned income tax credit, and we talk about the minimum wage and criminal justice reform. There's all kinds of issues that we could get into, but today we're gonna focus on education. That's not to say that that's the only thing that matters. I, I should also say that at Fordham, we certainly don't think that uh, upward mobility for low-income kids is the only goal of education reform. Uh, we also worry a lot about kids who are middle class or upper middle class, uh, kids who are high achieving. Uh, we think that in many respects their needs are not uh, paid attention to in our policy debates. Our friend Rick Hess at AEI talks about achievement gap mania. Uh, we certainly think that uh, you know our issues in this country around our education system are much bigger. That uh, certainly kids in middle class and upper middle class have uh, deserve better schools than we provide for them as well. But today our focus is going to be on kids growing up in poverty. The the 20 to 25 percent of kids who at any given point in time are living below the poverty line and how we can help them. All right, so the, the genesis of this conference and this book was, for me, a bit of a gut feeling, this suspicious feeling that those of us in education reform might be barking up the wrong tree, namely that we were overly focused on college as the pathway to the middle class and not focused enough on all the other possible routes. You know, a few years ago, I, I decided that I wanted to better understand the anti-poverty literature. So I talked to people like Ron Haskins and Isabel Sawhill and Sheldon Danziger uh, and asked them, you know, what to read and who to talk to. And one thing that became clear to me right away was that in the anti-poverty world, nobody in that world would say that college for all is a meaningful strategy 
uh, as an anti-poverty strategy, uh, you know, they would, are still focused on, hey, we still have, you know, 20% of kids dropping out of high school, much less talking about getting 100% of kids to and through college. I started writing about this on the Bridging Differences blog with Deborah Meyer and wrote a couple articles and, and started making the case, as, as people like Bob Schwartz have been doing now for years before me, saying that we needed a more balanced approach, you know, and that we were making a mistake by focusing on getting all kids, quote, college ready or to and through college. And the reaction was pretty fierce, right, from friends. They would say, Mike, you're giving up on kids. Or this, was a, this is a very popular one. Mike, would you want anything less for your own children? Right? You want your own kids to go to college, don't you? Why do you want something less for other people's kids? And furthermore, why do you want to consign people to a lifetime of low-wage work and poverty? You know, don't you understand, Mike, that if people don't, you know, go to college and get these college degrees, you know, you, you know, it's over for them in this economy. So these are good questions. These are reasonable concerns, and, and they deserve good answers, and today we're going to try to find some. And my hope is to step back and, again, to look at this theory of action guiding our education reform efforts and ask ourselves whether that theory is, in fact, sound. Because if it's not, it's possible that some of our policies and day-to-day -day actions could be misguided. So what is that theory of action that I see guiding what is now the sort of mainstream education reform agenda? Here's how I would describe it, right? We look at the economy that's rewarding people with college degrees and with these measurable skills uh, and an economy that is punishing people without those degrees and skills. We see a widening gap in this country between the highly educated and the poorly educated, that this is the real divide in, in the country today, and that these gaps show up in income inequality, that's certainly getting a lot of attention, but also in family formation, civic participation, health, happiness, all kinds of indicators, right? So those of us in education reform look at all of that, and we have concluded that we therefore have to get dramatically more young people, and especially young people growing up in poverty, into and through higher education. Ideally, four-year degrees, but these other credentials too. Uh, and again, we firmly believe that a high school diploma is no longer enough. So that gets us off and running on what is our reform agenda, right? A lot of us uh, in favor of enriching preschools, common core for grades K to 12, effective teachers, no excuses, college prep charter schools, uh, and intensive efforts to help first-generation students uh, make it through college. Uh, most of the focus is on academics, especially reading and math, though there is this growing interest in non-cognitive skills, or what some people call performance character. But uh, we are interested in those skills primarily because we think they will help kids to persist through college as a means to getting them uh, into the middle class. Now, again, plenty of people will, will acknowledge that other supports along the way are helpful. People talk about wraparound services in schools, health clinics in schools, or things outside of school, wage supports for families. You know, raise the minimum wage, more child tax credits, more earned income tax credits. Uh, but the, the goal within the education reform movement is still the same. The theory is still the same. Upward mobility via education. Right? Help kids do better in school, and that will help them do better in the economy. And this worldview that we've had and that I have shared for many years, that we look at an 18-year-old who's grown up in poverty, who graduates from high school, and then starts working full-time, does not go for any other further education, uh, and starts working in, in what is probably a low-skill, low-wage job. We look at that kid as something of a failure, that we have failed that kid, that that kid ended up on the wrong side of the educational divide. And what I want to ask today is whether... Uh, whether that theory of action makes sense, whether we're right to think of that as a failure. What if that 18-year-old, for example, what if he gets that low-wage job, but he shows up every day, and he starts gaining some important skills on the job, and he starts to get some raises, right? He avoids poverty traps of early uh, fatherhood uh, or incarceration or substance abuse. Let's say by 24 or 25, that, that kid's now making, you know, say $25,000 a year, right? Is self-sufficient, a good role model, upstanding member of the community. Have we failed that kid? Is that kid a failure? What if now at 24 or 25, he's ready to gain some additional skills, maybe go for one of those post-secondary credentials in order to get one of those middle skilled jobs? What if we're wrong that stopping with a high school diploma is equivalent to a life of poverty? 
What if that's just simply not true? That it's not that there's this sharp educational divide with sort of college graduates on one side and everybody else on the other side, but it's more of a continuum. And that we have been ignoring the middle of the continuum, the middle skilled jobs that can lead to a middle class uh, lifestyle because we haven't committed ourselves to preparing uh, young people for those middle skilled jobs. And what if by putting all of our focus on preparing students for higher education, we're overlooking other issues that matter just as much for their future? Issues like getting them ready to make good decisions around parenting uh, or working, the acquisition of useful workplace skills while in high school. Right? We're so focused on trying to get the proportion of kids going into and through college from, say, 10% of low-income kids to 20% of low-income kids, which would be an amazing accomplishment, that we're ignoring the needs of the other 80% that are not going to follow that route. Uh, and what if we learn that actually low-wage work is not the main cause of poverty in America? It's not working at all. Right? Our main problem are these incredibly low workforce participa participation rates that we're seeing. That what we need to get busy about is figuring out how to solve that problem. So my hope is that we can have an honest conversation about these things and, and find a middle ground between the utopianism that I think has, has really described a lot of education reform, right? We say, we're going to get 100% of kids to proficiency, and now we're going to get 100% of kids to college and career readiness, right? That's utopian. But on the other hand, many of the reform critics say, or at least it sounds to me like they're saying, we can't make any progress until we fix poverty. Clearly, there is a middle ground between those two extremes, and we want to find that middle ground uh, today. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start with the end in mind. We're going to start with the 18 to 24 year period and understand what success looks like in that period. We will talk about the role of higher education, right, which is these college degrees are as close as we have to a guarantee of some of a kid growing up in poverty ending up in the middle class. But we're going to talk about how that is playing out uh, in this country today. We're going to talk about the role of the success sequence, uh, Ron Haskins will be talking about this, the so-called success sequence that says if you get a high school diploma, if you work full time, and if you wait until you are 21 and married, you will not be poor in this country. You have a very low chance of being poor if you follow that sequence. Uh, we'll talk about post-secondary credentials uh, that other than college degrees, we'll talk about apprenticeships, okay? Then we'll go backwards. Once we have a vision of what is it we're preparing students for, right? I mean, a lot of what we're focused on in K-12 to is what happens next. So once we have a vision of what that looks like, then we'll go backwards. We'll start with high school. We'll say, what does it look like to have a multiple pathways approach in high school that is a, provides all kids a pathway to somewhere worth going to? And then we'll look at pre-K to 8 after that. And we'll finish the day with a panel where we're going to talk about the policy implications of all of this. If we have a different frame on education reform, if we decide that we've been, our focus has not been quite right, what does that mean for everything we've been working on? Common Core, teacher quality, uh, school choice, charter schools, and on and on. Uh, and at lunchtime, we get to hear from Hugh Price, uh, the former president of the National Urban League, who has a great new book out called Strugglers into Strivers, What the Military Can Teach Us About How Young People Learn and Grow. Uh, it is my view that uh, it is hard to find a, an institution that is better at helping uh, disadvantaged youth uh, transcend uh, the challenges that they were born with uh, and, and climb into the middle class, gain skills. Hard to find an institution doing that better today than the military. And so we're going to ask what we can learn from, from it. So again, let, let's try to keep an open mind, ask tough questions, and be willing to challenge our, our theory of action, challenge one another. And when we disagree, and we will today, let's remember that I think all of us in this room have the same goal, which is we want to sharply reduce intergenerational poverty. We want to spur upward mobility. The only question is how we go about doing that. With that, let me invite our first panel to come on up to the stage. Thank you. Dreaming because let's face it, that on a rainy day like today, how many of you would have gone all the way here instead of uh, out of bed? Yes, so uh, you're you're welcome for that. Uh, but the uh, the Twitter hashtag is upward mo hashtag upward mo. All right, great. Well, super excited about this first panel. As I said. Uh, this first panel, it's Escaping Poverty Through Education, Work, and Personal Responsibility. 
Uh, so we want to understand, again, what success looks like in the post-K-12 years, the, the, the 18 to 24 years. Uh, we have a fantastic panel with us today. It starts with Ron Haskins. He is the co-director of the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and uh, he is going to present his paper. Uh, all of these papers are available out in the lobby. They're up on our website. They are going to be turned into a book that we just found out will be published by Roman and Littlefield next fall. So we're super excited about that. Um, so let me introduce the rest of the panel before we do that. So we'll hear from Ron, then Andrew Kelly, the director of the Center on Higher Education Reform at the American American Enterprise Institute. Thank you, Andrew. I should give a shout out to AEI because this conference, if you might notice, is very much an AEI style conference, a Rick Hess style conference. The, the papers, the presentations, and all the rest. Yes, we'll send you your royalties later. Uh, Tamar Jacoby, uh, the president and CEO of Immigration Works USA, uh, and also a brand new organization called Opportunity America. Thank you very much. Looking for solutions around this very issue around upward mobility. And then we have Bob Lehrman, an institute fellow at the Center on Labor, Human Services, and Population at the Urban Institute. And uh, Bob is going to talk about apprenticeships. He is probably America's leading expert on apprenticeships and youth apprenticeships. And so excited to have that perspective uh, here today. And then finally, our respondent uh, is Rehan Salam, a policy fellow at the National Review Institute. And we really appreciate you being here. And, and you know, one of the goals that I had with this conference is to try to bring together people in the education world, but also the, the broader social policy world. Uh, and so we're going to get to hear from some of those, those voices, including Rehan's. So with that, Ron, Come on up and kick us off. You have eight minutes to present your paper. 16 pages and eight minutes. Can it be done? Um, let me start with two uh, brief comments. One is I uh, congratulate the audience for being here. Uh, we do a lot of events at Brookings, and we just count on it. When it's raining, the attendance at events cut by probably a third. Uh, so to see a full house here is really uh, remarkable. And second, I want to make a confession I've been in Washington for three decades, uh, worked primarily for Republicans on the Hill and in the White House, uh, and I, it always drove me nuts that everybody, that I, many of the people that I worked with, uh, thought that the key to solving poverty was the government. And I think the government should play an important role and does play an important role, but individual responsibility was hugely ignored. So I'm very pleased to be asked to talk about personal responsibility. Let's change the slide here. Uh, here is the basic argument. Uh, this is actually empirical. I do. You want me to do the slides? Uh, one? Sure. All right. Uh, I don't touch those things. Uh, <laughs> so here is the basic argument. Uh, this is based on current population survey data. This is actually what happened in the United States in 2008. So people that followed the su the question is, do they follow the success sequence, which is graduate from high school get a job and work close to full time, which is loosely defined, it's not 52 weeks a year, uh, and then wait till you're age 21 and get married before you have a baby. That's a very quaint idea nowadays, but nonetheless, if you follow all three of those rules, as you can see, you have a virtual no chance of living in poverty. It's about 2% and 74%, I, I can't see that far, 73% of, of joining the middle class, which is defined in this case as over about $55,000 a year. Uh, by contrast, if you don't follow any of the norms, it almost flips. So for people actually living in the United States, this is their condition. If they follow the rules, they're in the middle class, they're not in poverty. If they don't, and the, all the grad gradations in between. So this is correlational. I want to admit that off the bat. It's not causal. But I think that in any situation where you can then show that these factors that, are, that I'm arguing are important are shown in many studies, causal studies, random assignment studies that allow causal conclusions, then I think it gives, it's a good backup to, this, to these data. Okay, next, skip the next slide and go to the one after that. So I just want to run through very quickly, I want to give you an idea of the immensity of the task we face if we take the route of personal responsibility. Two, one more. Okay, so here's the employment to population ratio, starting with work, and as you can see, the, the glorious story here is low-income moms 
And uh, in this case, it's never married mothers, which are most disadvantaged, most likely live in poverty. Huge increase in the 90s when the economy was very good. It's tailed off a little since then, in both associated with the recession of 2001 and then the, the Great Recession. <clears throat> Up at the top is a historic decline in male labor force participation. Same thing happened in Europe. Something wrong with the guys in the United States and Europe. You see this in education all over the place. Uh, so it's, and then low income minority men. It, the story is horrible. It hardly ever been above 60%. Now it's under 50%. You cannot build a community with males having 50% or less work rate. It, ugly to say that. Um, I apologize profusely for saying it, but it's true. Next slide. So we got problems with employment. The next slide is the most amazing slide I think I've seen in 40 years of doing social science research. This shows the relationship between education income during the prime earning years, family income, uh, ages 30, 39, starting at the bottom, high school dropout, high school, uh, some college, four-year degree, professional or PhD. And as you can see, the lines never touch. So it always paid to have more education, always. The second thing, though, is that if you look at these, the distance between the lines is getting greater and greater and greater. The payoff to education is getting greater all the time. And another notable thing that still amazes me is the only two groups that are doing better as a group in the last two or three decades are people who have a four-year degree. So if you want to do better relative to people in your status in the past, you have to have a four-year degree or, uh, or uh, a professional degree. Now, this in no way contradicts Mike's statement. Look at the lines again. It always pays to have more education, even though you're not doing better than people with your education did in the past. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because someone else is going to talk about it. I just want to call your attention to one thing, which is these are all kids from the bottom quintile. This is from the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, University of Michigan. And on the left are kids from the bottom quintile whose parents were in the bottom quintile. Today, that would be roughly 25,000 or less. Uh, and they have about over 40% chance of winding up in the bottom themselves. This is the lack of mobility uh, that Mike was talking about. But if they get a college degree, it plummets. And, by con and similarly, if you look at the top, the probability of making it all the way to the top dramatically increases with a college degree. So college really pays off and would really do, I think you said this, Mike, it would be very helpful, but it's a bad strategy because a lot of kids just simply can't do it. I totally agree with Mike. Next slide. And this is what's happened with the American family. Uh, the marriage rates on the top left, they've been going down for everybody, uh, going down the most quickly for the youngest ages. So maybe we're not even through this revolution yet. Uh, next is a result of non-marital births. I've done careful research. And I found that even though people aren't married, sex remain popular. <laughs> and as a result of that, it's inevitable that non-marital birth rates would go up, which they did. And the last chart shows the bottom line in this, which is that the percentage of kids who live with, married, with their married parents has declined greatly. And obviously, on the contrast is that uh, a huge increase in kids in female headed families, the rates of poverty are four times as high as in married couple families. Uh, and they, anything that's good, they have less of it. Anything that's bad, they have more of it, literally, from social science research. And I've seen a revolution in universities in the United States in admitting that the best rearing environment for kids is a married couple family. Next slide. Okay, I, what I did in the paper, and I'm, no, how much time do I have? Two. 10 minutes. Two. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right, so what I did in the paper then was to look for evidence, mostly random assignment evidence, that schools could do something about all three of these problems. And these are really remarkable studies. Uh, for example, career academies, eight-year follow-up, eight sites, uh, random assignment in high school. The essence, I think, of the degree of smaller schools and a bunch of stuff, four or five elements in there. But the biggest part of it is that the kids had continuous experiences in workplaces. So the kids knew, and these are mostly low income, mostly minority kids. They knew what it was like to go to work. They heard incessantly about soft skills and so forth and so on. When eight years after their scheduled high school graduation date, few effects on girls, but the boys were more likely to work they earned on average $2,000 more a year, and get this, they were 33% more, 
more likely to be married. Women are discerning. They don't like to marry guys that don't earn money. Look at Kathy Eden's work. It's very clear. So there, this is a huge thing high schools could do. I don't have to talk about the others because other two people on this panel are going to do this, especially my old friend Bob Blairman. You can't be Bob's friend unless you sing the praises of apprenticeship. So I learned to do that after the first time I met Bob. They'll talk about So we got a lot of things that high schools could do to increase work. And of course, this is based on a premise that Mike had, which is not everybody's going to go to college. It's an honorable, good thing to get a two-year degree or even to get an apprenticeship, good thing to do. Second, community colleges. I looked for studies of two-year uh, institutions. Low-income kids have a horrible, horrible record in both four years and two-year colleges. They drop out, they have debts, so forth and so on. There are a number of random assignment studies that show that there are things we can do. I mentioned two of them in the paper, something called learning communities where people groups of about 25, they work together, they work with the same professors, they take some common courses, and they do better. They stay in school longer. The same thing with performance-based scholarships. Would you believe it? If you give people a mere $2,000, they stay in school longer, they get more credits, they get better grades. So give them money and that helps. Um, marriage, I don't think there's much the high schools can do about marriage. There's a lot of talk about marriage education, but there's almost no evidence that it works in high school. So I looked at teen pregnancy prevention, which has been shown repeatedly in research, to increase the probability if a young woman has a baby outside marriage, and even if a guy's involved, uh, and while well, he's still a teenager, it reduces the probability that they'll marry later. So they're very good studies. The Obama administration has a spectacular initiative. There are 35 model programs that have either random assignment or quasi-experimental evidence that they work. One of the most famous is a CRARA program. And incidentally, these are broad programs. They don't just focus on birth control. They focus on giving people hope for the future. So they have a lot of community activities. They have found that especially effective is to get kids involved in things where they're helping other people, working at soup kitchens and that kind of thing. So we can do a lot about teen pregnancy. It's one of the few national indicators that we have really improved. We've cut the teen pregnancy rate by 50, more than 50, almost 60% since 1991. 10% in, uh, in the last period that the uh, data has been released. So the bottom line here is that schools can do a lot by focusing on personal responsibility. I do not mean that they should ignore the basics, but there's a lot they could do. If they do it, it would make a big difference without necessarily getting kids to achieve a four-year college degree. Thank you. A tiny bit over on, but, but well worth it. And I just want to say, for those of you uh, out there in internet land or in the audience who are tweeting, nobody tweeted Ron's uh, joke about sex, and I'm a little disappointed about that. So <laughs> as an audience, come on. Uh, when the humor happens, people take advantage of it. Okay, Andrew Kelly, uh, give us something tweetable. Eight minutes. I'll do my own slides if they're somewhere. They should be around here. Oh, they should be right behind them. Oh, oh let's see. Mind. Good question. Oh, uh, well, I'm glad Ron went first. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm glad Ron went first because I was told no uh, words on the slides, just pictures. And uh, Ron, Ron's had more words than mine do. Um, so if we can get them up there, that would be great. Um, and I'm also gonna, I'll skip over some of what I had to say. Ron did a great job uh, uh, summarizing some of what I was gonna say. My paper tr uh, tries to reconcile uh, three sets of facts. Uh, uh, one is that the payoff um, to a college degree in terms of mobility is, is enormous for low-income um, kids. Um, it can catapult them from, uh, from the bottom to the top uh, uh, rungs of, of the economic ladder. Uh, uh, the second thing is that uh, high school graduation rates and college going rates are at all-time highs. Um, uh, and then the third, uh, third fact is, then why have mobility rates been stagnant over the past uh, uh, decades? Uh, a big study um, uh, recently found that, that they haven't improved much. Um, so, uh, you know, explaining this disconnect is the point of the paper. So quickly, Ron went over this. I have the same figure. It's just a different way of looking at it. Uh, if you, it this is uh, uh, from the Pew study of economic mobility. Um, if you are born in the bottom quintile and you're in a college degree, um, you have a better than 50% chance of making it to the middle class or above. Um, and if you don't, you are, uh, you're almost, you know, half of them wind up in the bottom. Um, why, is, why is the payoff so huge? Well, the payoff is big because the uh, uh, economic re uh, returns are still large. So 
people are probably saying, well, how can that be? I keep reading these stories in the New York Times about kids that are living in their parents' basements and can't find work, right? And it's true that the wages of recent college graduates, this is from the Economic Policy Institute, I realize I left the note out, data from them, um, uh, it's true that the wages of, of, uh, of recent college grads have actually flattened out and in some cases declined, but high school students have it, high school graduates have it even worse, um, and so the, the wage premium has actually grown over time. So this is the ratio of, of entry level wages of college graduates to high school graduates. So you have two lines, Ron actually showed some of this, that the, the, college, uh, earnings, the college earnings of college graduates have actually started to tick down just a little bit, um, but the wages of high school graduates are actually going down uh, at a much faster rate, so the wage premium is still robust. Um, so I was going to get this, uh, this t-shirt for all my friends who are academics. Um, so a couple caveats here, of course, uh, on average doesn't mean always, uh, right? So we, we talk a lot about the average uh, wage of college graduates. Doesn't mean always. A recent study from the New York, uh, for the Federal Reserve Bank in New York found that actually uh, uh, graduates in the bottom 20, 25%, the 25th percentile, actually don't earn any more than a high school graduate and haven't for years, uh, bachelor's degree recipients. Um, uh, fields of study, it's, uh, earnings vary dramatically depending on the field of study you choose. Um, so some fields are worth a lot, of, uh, a lot of money in the labor market, others aren't. Um, uh, and a, a, a positive wage premium doesn't also, also doesn't necessarily translate to greater um, absolute mobility, right? So if you're, if you're graduating from college and you're actually earning and earnings are flat and or declining, you may not actually earn more than your parents who were working 40, you know, 30 or 40 years before you and actually were successful with a, with a high school diploma. Um, but the biggest caveat is, here's some words, I'm sorry, this might hurt your eyes. Um, uh, going to college doesn't equal completing college and this is where the big uh, this is where the big disconnect is. So uh, this is, these are, these are uh, 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 tabulations from the uh, Educational Longitudinal Study, which followed um, uh, high school sophomores from 2002 through 2012. Um, and so this is educational attainment. Uh, and it's disaggregated. We're going from quintiles to quartiles. So the people who do economic mobility talk in quintiles because they like having that middle uh, bar. And NCES does quartiles. Uh, so we don't, have, we don't have the middle. They derive variables uh, for SES. Um, so you can see the disconnect here. So that big payoff that, that you saw in the graph, uh, in the mobility graph, uh, it's weighted by a very small probability for people who are born um, in the bottom SES quartile. Um, uh, more than half either don't, go, don't make it to college or go to some college and drop out. Um, just, about, just over 14% actually make it to a bachelor's degree. If you include uh, certificates and associate's degrees, it starts to look a little bit uh, more positive. Um, uh, you know, Tamar's going to talk about certificates um, in a moment, um, uh, but it's still a, a pretty low probability. Um, so, what's the uh, whoops? Uh, so, why is this happening? Well, I think in the paper I talk about distinguishing two different challenges. The first challenge is college readiness and the lack thereof. Um, that's, that's a distinct problem. The second is students who are college ready, low income students who are college ready and still don't make it. So first I wanna talk about college readiness. This is something Mike talked about a bunch in his, um, in his introduction. Mike and I have gone back and forth for going on two years now about college readiness and Pell eligibility and should students who aren't college ready be Pell eligible or not. You can go look it up and read it. Um, read our old tweets, there are lots of them. Um, but, but we do have a college readiness problem. Again, this is data from um, the beginning post-secondary student survey uh, and NCS survey. So, uh, and these are, income, um, these are income quartiles, not SCS, a little different. But um, you can see that the, the, uh, students in the, from the lowest income um, uh, range, 58% um, have to take a remedial class. They take on average three remedial classes, but they only pass on average two, so they fail one. Um, um, often. Uh, Remediation is a dead end for a lot of students, for most students. Um, uh, an NCS study found that 17% uh, of students who test into remedial English ever, ever earn a degree. 27% um, of those who test into remedial math ever earn a degree. Um, those are very low odds. So if you test into remediation, you're in big trouble. Um, there's a lot of wishful thinking in the higher ed reform community that we can sort of uh, fix fix 12 years of really bad uh, uh, schooling, and maybe not really bad schooling, but underachievement, let's say, um, in a couple semesters of college. So we can just sort of gear, you know, bone people up on, on, uh, on, on college readiness. So this is actually, this, anybody who's a Lord of the Rings fan uh, may recognize that. That's not Game of Thrones, that's Lord of the Rings. That's an earlier uh, Sean Bean era. Um, so 
I think this is wishful thinking in many cases. I mean, you have students that are coming in with with um, with really low reading levels, uh, and and we're and and high school uh, community college instructors are expected to get them up to a college ready standard in a semester or two. Um, that is that's nuts. We also have a problem of K twelve and higher ed just sort of pointing fingers at one another. Uh, higher ed, you know, the students show up to higher ed unprepared, and and they say, well, what's going on to the K twelve system? The K twelve system says, hey, they got a degree with us. They passed all of our assessments. Um, you know, it's not our problem. You must be giving them the wrong wrong exam. So um, what I talk about in the paper is one promising strategy, I think, that would actually be low cost uh, in the remedial uh, in remediation is to test students much earlier and diagnose their needs and uh, uh, prepare them for some of these placement tests. There's been evidence, there's evidence that if people actually know that the, uh, the stakes of the, of the placement exam and they have some time maybe to bone up for it and get ready for it, um, that they'll pass and avoid remediation completely. Um, uh, and we also have some evidence that people are misplaced in remediation because the assessments aren't perfect. Um, obviously, like any any assessment is. So, uh, so let's talk now about the about the. Um about the folks who are actually college ready when they graduate from high school, even many of them fall off the path, right? And uh, 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 there's a professor of law, uh, jo Joseph Fishkin, Joseph Fishkin, who wrote a book um, about um, bottlenecks, uh, which is his theory about economic mobility is that there are these key moments um, in people's lives, and there are bottlenecks there where people get caught up and they don't actually uh, get through. So college is one of the bottlenecks that he cites. So a lot of low-income kids, they're on the right path, they run into an obstacle, and they get sort of uh, pushed off the path. For me, um, I would put the bottlenecks, the bottleneck of college readiness in a very different category than the bottleneck, than other bottlenecks, like failure to fill out a financial aid form, failure to matriculate after you've applied um, to college and so on. The former sort people according to their academic abilities and their talents. Um, that's why college degrees have the value that they do, because they do that. Um, the, the latter, though, are procedural, arbitrary uh, sorting mechanisms, right? Can you fill out a bureaucratic form? Can you, um, can you convince your parents to give you their tax information? So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those, that latter set of, that's the latter set of bottlenecks. So what's that, how many? Quickly, sure. So what stops the college ready? So uh, college is much more expensive than it used to be, um, obviously. Uh, tuition at public four-year colleges has gone up um, uh, thir nearly 30% in the last decade alone. Um, what else? Even if students can afford it, um, they have trouble finding an option that fits them because information is very poor in this market. Students can't rely on their networks to provide them with guidance on where to, sh where to go to, that's going to serve them well. Um, they don't know the likely return on investment from programs. They don't have, those, they don't have that data. They don't know how much the average debt is from a, from a given institution. And the last thing is a lot of colleges and universities are not student ready, right? They're not designed to support student success. I mean, think about this. You, go, you, get, you show up at a community college. You don't choose a major. You sort of swirl around. You take a few classes here. You take a few classes there. Um, uh, and then later on, you're asked to, to sign up to a, path, to, to a path of study. So what can we do to fix these things? Uh, Ron already talked about um, performance-based scholarships. This is something I discussed in the paper. Um, there's a sense that more money, more student aid is not necessarily going to solve all these problems. We've just made record investments in the Pell Grant um, uh, over the past uh, five or six years. Years, the purchasing power of the Pell is now at an all-time low, despite that. Why? Because it's been wiped away by increases in tuition. So performance-based scholarships are one promising idea. Um, I also have some ideas about private sector finance in there as well. Um, uh, in terms of informing students, uh, helping them find a better choice, um, Carolyn Hoxby and Sarah Turner did a terrific study, um, a really amazing field experiment, where they sent uh, low-income, high-achieving students uh, personalized guides about their college choices. They reduced the rates of undermatch. It, it increased your rate of enrolling at a matched college by about 50 percent, which, which is a massive effect. Um, and then the last side, the, the, the last piece is how do we get colleges and universities to improve um, and to be focused on student success? And I talk in the paper about some, some work there. Um, it involves changing the way colleges and universities operate. It involves changing the way they interface with students, how they organize for student learning. Um, that's a much bigger challenge uh, to figure out how to, get, how to um, structure the incentives such that they do that. And then just quickly last, we can't forget about the supply side. So a lot of the discussion uh, in higher ed policy and reform has been how do we guide people to better choices? That assumes that there's space in the, in the better programs, right? That there are seats. Um, and there, there isn't always, right? You, you look at nursing programs, for instance, which have big returns, for, especially for, uh, for, for low-income students. Um, they're full. They have huge waiting lists. You can't get into them, right? So we can't forget about the supply side uh, 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 of uh, the supply of quality seats. And I talk a bit, a bit about that in the paper. So uh, please go read it, because that was uh, 8,000 words in eight minutes.
can't get through it. So thanks. More like 11 minutes, but who's counting? That's right. Okay, Tamar, come on up. And by the way, Andrew, very smart ways to put text into his pictures. That, that was brilliant. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, good. So thank you so much, Mike. Thank to all of you for coming out on this rainy morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with my distinguished colleagues, partly because they're so distinguished, but also because of the way they've set up my uh, talk. <laughs> um, both Ron and Andrew do a brilliant job in their papers of showing how and why college doesn't always work for disadvantaged kids. Both talk a lot about alternative, in their chapters at least, about alternative paths and new options and industry credentials, and they point to these new options as something very exciting, and then they stop in mid-sentence. Um, so it's a perfect segue for me. And what I'm here to talk about is to fill you in a little bit on what some of these alternatives are. Um, what are they exactly? How do they work? What do they mean for K through 12 educators? And what are some of the kinds of policy changes that are needed to make them more broadly available? And I'm going to do all that in eight minutes. Um, so what are we talking about? What are these alternative pathways? Well, let's just start with a real world economic bottom line. Uh, let's talk about some average salaries for jobs that don't don't require college degrees. Licensed practical nurse, Andrew mentioned nursing, start in the $40,000 a year range and can get as high as $60,000 if you do the kind of overtime and extra shifts and whatever that most LPNs sign up for. Welders start in the high 30s, low 40s, can get to the six figures easily. Many welders make in the six figures, especially if you're willing to travel uh, or work in the energy sector. Precision, preci I can say this, precision machinists in advanced manufacturing also start in the low 40s, often go north of 70 uh, into the six figures. And the point is, we all know this, technology is transforming the economy and the world of work. Um, many economists are worried about the, uh, the way technology is destroying jobs, and it certainly is destroying some jobs, but it's also creating jobs and indeed creating new professions. Economists predict that a third or perhaps half of the jobs coming online in the next five years will be what people call middle skill, requiring less than a BA but more than a high school diploma, um, usually some kind of technical training. So the question for us, right, education conference, is how do you prepare for a job like that? And there are many different ways, uh, many different venues, high schools, community college, Votech centers, often in companies, sometimes even online. But the easiest way to make sense of it all, I think, um, is one thing I'd like to look at is the non-degree credentials you can earn in these different venues. So not all technical workers earn a credential, but the world of non-degree credentials is exploding. It's the hottest new thing in some, um, in, in some employers' world, and by extension among certain educators. Um, and I'm going to zero in on two of the fastest growing type of non-degree awards, certificates and certifications. And I'm really sorry for the confusing technology. It's the curse of this world. I mean, the two most ex exciting things are certificates and certifications, only they're really different. Um, it's like with a sliced bread and the wheel, um, but you can't tell them apart. Um, but long story short, a certificate is something you earn in school, often a community college. It's similar to a degree, but it's in a technical, usually in a technical subject. It takes less time than a degree, usually a year, sometimes two, but they're generally short. And they're technical subjects, right? Auto mechanics, electronics, construction, uh, nursing, uh, and they're very popular. So the number of certificates has skyrocketed in the last two decades from about 300,000 in 19 1994 to over a million uh, in 2012. The wage premium to a certificate, well, it can be between 20 to 35 percent above high school. And in some fields, you can earn more with a certificate than an associate's or a bachelor degree. More with a certificate than an associate's or bachelor degree in some fields, technical fields. So those are certificates. Certifications are, if anything, even more interesting in my view. How they work, the best analogy is not a degree, it's more like a driver's license. So when you go to the rental car company, they, don't, they ask to see your driver's license. They don't ask you where you got it. You know, is this a Harvard driver's license or a community college driver's license? They don't ask you how you learned to drive or who taught you. All they care is that you know how to drive. And that's true often in the world of work too, right? Especially technical jobs. They don't care where you learned it. They care that you know how to do it. So industry certifications 
um, are basically standards devised by employers, uh, kind of occupational profiles. Employer groups, trade associations, whatever, examine the technical or other competencies that are required for a given job. They come up with a set of standards that well-trained workers need to know. They turn those standards into a test and then educators across the country and in some fields across the world teach to that test. The employer who eventually hires the trainee doesn't care where or how he prepared for the test. It could be at a community college or a high school or a vocational center or a company or self-study on the internet. Um, what matters is that the trainee passed the test. And of course, this is revolutionary for education, right? Suddenly, institutions and institutional rankings don't really matter all that much. The kind of federal oversight we've built up around K through 12 in college, you know, may or may not matter. And seat time in class no longer matters. What matters is competency, however you've acquired it. And the other key point is that employers are setting the standards. So there's a much closer, more direct relationship, basically a straight line, between what the kids are learning and what they need to know on a job. So there's a lot more to say about industry certifications, read my paper, um, but the point is they're taking off like, you know, hula hoops or the latest iPhone. Um, and the fields where they're most common, IT, advanced manufacturing, construction, healthcare, goes on and on, down to retail. IT employers and employer groups, Microsoft, Cisco, others, have literally given out tens of millions of cer industry certifications in the last two decades. I mean, it's a whole universe in and of itself. The Business Roundtable and the National Association of Manufacturing are back the development of scores of more certifications in other fields. High schools, community college, trade associations, Votech centers, even franchise learning centers are teaching to these tests. And according to the Census Bureau, about 5% of adults hold industry certifications. Even more stunning number, 25% of adults, or more than 50 million people, hold a technical or professional non-degree credential. Uh, and the Census Bureau, when they count them, they include licenses, which is a little problematic in my view, but it's still a pretty stunning number, 25% of US adults hold a non-degree credential. So what does this mean for K through 12 educators? Well, I'm running out of time, but I want to make three quick points. Number one is it's coming to a movie theater near you soon, if it isn't there already. Um, Non-degree credentials are showing up in high schools. Lots of high schools have career and technical education programs where kids can earn certificates or certifications. IT, construction, healthcare are among the most popular. And what's most interesting about this to me is the way it's transforming the path from high school to college. Um, the critical term is dual enrollment. And the point is you take a course in high school, you earn the credential, and then it functions like an AP credit, uh, saving you time and money in college or community college, where you earn the next credential in the sequence, right? A more advanced course in computer programming or nursing or, 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 or machining. Um, and then you get a certificate, you take a test there and you get a certificate there. And the point is it becomes a career path that helps a lot of kids who other might fall through the cracks between high school and college make that transition more smoothly. Um, it also opens up an opportunity for lifelong learning, right? Because a lot of people are in their first credential in high school, and then they, you know, then the same from the same trade association, they learn another few credentials in college, and then they continue on the job, earning the more advanced and the more advanced, and of course rising in salary as they do. Point number two, and this will surprise a lot of you, um, non-degree credentials are not an inferior track. Um, employers and educators from this world of industry credentials are very clear. As one employer said to me recently, we don't want the C's and the D's. We want the A's and the B's. Um, according to these employers and educators, these students need to be college and career ready. A lot of these programs have a lot of math. I mean, try precision machining, like I couldn't do the math. Um, and so K through 12 educators are not off the hook. These, they still need to prepare kids, although it might be a different kind of preparation, right? A story I, you hear again and again in this field from the kids and the teachers is about the kid who had no interest in math and no aptitude for it, he thought, until he had to figure out the volume of a cylinder in automotive class. And suddenly he was interested and good at it and it wasn't that hard and it wasn't that scary anymore. So the point is some of these kids learn in different ways um, and a lot of the kids who are now failing math might do better if it was presented more practically.
And that leads to my last point, which is number three, which is this doesn't necessarily require tracking. On the contrary, I think it's about choices. Um, and educators and employers in this uh, world of certifications think that all kids should be given these choices. They should be exposed to the world of work much earlier. Ron talked about that. All kinds of work, including technical work, can be field trips when they're little, job shadowing and internships later. They should be encouraged to think more about what they like to do and what they're good at. And most important, they should be taught they have choices, that college isn't the only or best route, and practical work can be fulfilling and remunerative. So there's a lot more to say about that, but the one thing I do want to just flick at in closing is some policy issues. So I'm sure I'm not telling you anything surprising, but the main challenge for policymakers and the rest of us who believe in these alternative paths is to eliminate the stigma that comes with technical training, um, to eliminate the idea we all have, even many champions of technical training, that it's somehow second rate, and as, you know, as, as, as Mike said, that it's not for your kids. <laughs> it's a royal road to college, but not for other people's kids. Um, that the royal road is college, and the uh, technical training is for other people's kids. And clearly there's no uh, silver bullet for that, right? That's gonna take many years and many different stratagems to eliminate that stigma. Um, I, actually believe, I actually believe that a well-developed system of non-degree credentials will help um, because after all, um, cred you know, credential certifications aren't that different from degrees. Degree, certificate, certification, you know, they're kind of same kind of thing. You could almost confuse them. And eventually, I'm convinced that for some kids, non-degree credentials will start to look as appealing as degrees, um, especially if it turns out you can earn a better return to a certification and, or get, and get on a better, more, more navigable path, surer path to the middle class. So bottom line, I think just the existence of these awards can start to erase the sigma, stigma, and I think we should, I believe we should take steps to strengthen and promote them. Federal and state policymakers should create incentives for schools to teach to industry credentials. Uh, business and industry should create whatever frameworks or standards are necessary to distinguish meaningful credentials from the ones that lead nowhere, and there are plenty that lead nowhere. And finally, and most radically, I believe that Title IV education funding should be reformed to put technical training that leads to an industry credential on a par with academic programs programs that culminate in a degree. Not only would that help a lot of kids struggling to pay for training, but it would also go a long, long way to eliminate the stigma. That's kind of a bombshell. I'm surprised nobody gasped. <laughs> but I think I'll stop there, and I look forward to the conversation in Q&A. Thank you, Tamar. Very good. Come on up, Bob. I think you can tell this is mostly a K-12 audience. We're, uh... <laughs> we know what Title I is, but Title IV? What is it? We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Bob. You don't want to tomorrow's purchase. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, well, just as Tamar said, the two previous speakers uh, set her up. I, I would say the three previous speakers set me up. Um, Ron on the role of work, and uh, actually I recently saw, saw a book that hasn't been gotten a lot of play called The Long Shadow about Baltimore kids growing up in poverty that uh, were followed from first grade all the way through their late 20s. And the role of work in that uh, group in preventing poverty, even among people that only have a high school diploma, is quite striking. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Andrew, on the weakness of what we call, what I call the academic only approach uh, to skill preparation, and tomorrow on the role of certifications um, and non-degree credentials. So uh, I'm gonna talk about, in a sense, uh, a delivery system for providing these kinds of credentials, but doing so uh, in a way that links work with earning credentials, and that is uh, apprenticeship. I hope we can go back to the slide here. You had it at one point. Can you come up with it again? You, you had my uh, PowerPoint up at one point. OK. Well, all right, let me, let me go on without the, the PowerPoint. And that, that, the first thing is, um, what do we mean by apprenticeship? No, that's not it. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody must have uh, 
That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so um, a, apprenticeship is a way of um, here. Let's see if I can. It's a structured, in-depth program um, of work-based and academic instruction, leading to uh, an occupational credential. And the whole idea is that you begin to master a particular field. Usually takes two to four years, and the apprentices are employed and paid. Um, it does differ from school-based vocational education, including the things that Tamar was talking about, uh, because those tend to have very little work-based learning. And even in the career academies, um, not everybody got the work-based learning. I'm told that the, the big success was among those that did, but not everybody does, e even in career academies. Um, it differs from on-the-job training in that it's on-the-job training is less in-depth. It's more oriented toward a job and not a career. It's certainly not linked to occupational standards, um, and there's less of a coordination between theory and practice. So why do robust apprenticeship programs make sense? Um, and these are the reasons you can read them. Um, among those that I would highlight are that um, it does prepare people for a career, not just a job. It provides uh, different ways of learning than sitting in a classroom. One of the unstated comments that I would make about the academic discussion is the gap, not just by income, but by gender, by sex. Uh, what we're seeing is young men are the ones that are falling well behind. And some of that may be they don't like to sit in class all day, and they like to be doing something. Um, these, the, the idea of pride, I think, is really important. Um, when you master an occupational area, you have a sense of pride. You're the best one in that field. Um, we tend to judge people on their academic merit. Uh, judged on that basis, only 10% can be in the top 10%. But if you judge people around a variety of uh, areas, uh, many people can be in the top 10% of their field. Um, and they take pride in it. Um, recently, when I was talking to a group of German businessmen and I mentioned that comment on pride, they all sort of shook their heads that this was the big thing that they saw. It has natural mentors, which is very important for low-income kids. Instead of having one advisor in a community college for every five, 600 kids, you have a mentor for every two or three, uh, sometimes even more. It has very low cost to the government. So for a much smaller amount of money than we're investing in higher education, we could expand uh, apprenticeship dramatically um, and also, you can, might think of it as a kind of college plus, because apprentices are taking courses at least at the level of community colleges. Um, and finally, I think it's a competitive advantage. Um, we're seeing now uh, German and Swiss companies come to the United States, and they're very annoyed by the absence of a very good skill development system. And they even think that although the United States has many advantages from an investment point of view, uh, this is one big disadvantage. And if we could solve that, uh, we could attract a lot more uh, employers. Uh, let's just look at a few numbers. Um, this is the best that I saw where we've compared people and these are net gains. These are gains relative to a, a comparison group of people who had similar work histories before entering these programs. And what you can see from all these numbers is that apprenticeship training wipes out uh, even those that graduate in a professional technical uh, education from uh, community colleges. So even in the first two and a half years, uh, through through their uh, training period, the community college period and the training period, um, already 
um, young people are gaining the equivalent of 56,000 greater than a comparison group. Um, and over time, it's something like three times the number. So the benefits are pretty clear. And, and the benefits, if you look at other countries, you see high-income countries, which don't have more than about 20 to 25 percent of people uh, graduating from, with BAs, in very high-income professions, um, Switzerland perhaps being the best example. So there are big returns to youth. There are big returns to government. Um, but what about some myths about apprenticeship? Um, I don't think I, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Now you can ignore the table for a bit. Um, so some people say, well, it's too narrow. Uh, you're going to be training people in fields that will be no longer in existence later on, and they won't be adaptable. Turns out the opposite is true. When you get a good training, good, and I'm talking about a two to three year apprenticeship, you're able to range in different fields and stay, and typically people stay in the same cluster of occupations. A second myth is that, well, nobody wants to do it. Um, there's a stigma. Well, all you have to do is look at good apprenticeship programs and see how oversubscribed they are in the United States. Um, the apprenticeship school, for example, in Newport News, Virginia, which takes 250 apprentices per year in a four-year program, uh, where they're starting work every day from the first day, but also learning. Uh, they take 250, they have 6,000 applications. Uh, if you look at any of the good uh, construction uh, apprenticeship programs, you'll find, again, huge over, it's highly oversubscribed. And what we've seen in countries that have expanded apprenticeship, especially England, that in a very short period of time, apprenticeship becomes a very important mainstream option. Over half of kids that want to become engineers in England today want to do it through apprenticeship, not through just a, a pure college approach. So attitudes can change very, very quickly. What about employers? Will employers do it? That's one of the big issues. Whoops. Uh, well, what, what we've seen in the literature is that most apprenticeships, the companies are able to recoup all or most of their investment during the apprenticeship period. And the reason is that young people, they start out doing very simple tasks, and you're paying them and you're training them. And so it costs you money. That's the first part, the employer costs. But very quickly, they move into more skilled positions, which ironically is why apprenticeships, in a way, are, easy, are better for firms than internships. You might say, well, internships are cheap and so on. They are. But six months later, when the kid is able to do some more complicated things, they leave. So you're not able to recoup a lot of the investment through higher worker productivity. And there's a recent article that documents that in a couple of countries. So what can we do? We wrap up, what, two minutes? OK. Two minutes. <laughs> what, what can we do um, to expand apprenticeship? First, we have to recognize it's possible. Uh, England went from 150,000 to over 800,000 in a short period of time. Even in the United States, South Carolina went from 90 companies to 700 companies during the economic downturn. So we need to widen the occupational scope of apprenticeship in the United States. It's been too geared toward uh, construction. If you go to my website, innovativeapprenticeship.org, you'll find a wide variety of uh, occupations in my occupational standards sections. Um, so we need to provide money. We need to help states scale apprenticeship by branding apprenticeship at the state level or even at the national level, and by having a cadre of people who can sell apprenticeship to companies. We ought to do what 
every other country does, which is provide the funding for the academic part of apprenticeship. Uh, every apprenticeship has what's called related courses, and virtually every other country funds that through public money. We don't. Uh, one way to do that might be to uh, incrementally do it, would be to extend the use of Pell Grants, WIA vouchers, trade adjustment assistance vouchers uh, for apprenticeship. We can expand youth apprenticeship. Um, there are big programs in Georgia, smaller one in Wisconsin. We can designate best practice occupational standards for apprenticeships so that companies can more seamlessly enter apprenticeship knowing what those standards are. And we can link it with the certifications that Tamar mentioned. <clears throat> um, and then as the numbers of apprenticeship slots grow, we will have a sales job with uh, uh, parents. I don't think it will be a huge job because people will see the value of earning and learning. Finally, I mean, when I talk to regular people about apprenticeships, not policy experts or academics, almost all of them get it. Almost all of them say, well, yeah, you know, I had one kid that college was perfect, they loved it, they thrived, but my other kid, you know, he wasn't quite ready for college. He, he, might, he wanted to do something hands-on. He wanted to go out and do some real work. Uh, or, the, you know, people know that. And so by providing a really robust apprenticeship system, we can provide a much broader range of pathways, uh, not only to low-income kids, uh, but to all kids. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Very nicely done, Bob. Okay, Rehan, come on up and uh, tell us what you think. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, so it turns out that I've been set up by all four of the people who've spoken before me. So I suppose I win. Uh, I just have a few stray thoughts uh, relating to all of the remarks we've heard so far. But I really want to focus on one core idea, and that's the idea of mutual support networks. We're talking today about upward mobility, yet to some extent what we also care about is the stickiness of upward mobility. Yes, it's true that not enough people are upwardly mobile. It's also true that some people who are upwardly mobile in one generation find that their children fail to maintain that status, or they themselves, when they face the vagaries of economic change, find that it's hard to, to stick to the middle class or, or better off than that. So I just want to start with a, a few very quick anecdotes. Um, uh, so there are three people I've encountered recently, uh, two of whom are friends, one of whom uh, is a, more of an acquaintance, uh, who to me illustrates some of these larger issues that I think we need to be thinking about uh, in the policy discourse. Uh, one of them is a gentleman who uh, is in his late 50s, uh, who is an immigrant, uh, someone uh, with limited skills but a, a very formidable work ethic. 20% uh, of the taxi drivers in New York City are people of Bangladeshi origin, like my parents, and he's one of them. Uh, and he managed to purchase a taxi medallion some years ago. Uh, you know, it was a very leveraged bet. Uh, he borrowed an enormous amount of money, yet he felt as though it was a, a perfectly sound investment. Uh, you know, the values of medallions have been going up quite since consistently, partly because, you know, it's a scarce resource. There are not a lot of them sold. They're released in dribs and drabs. Seemed like a solid bet, and a financial institution is willing to make that bet with him. Uh, but in recent years, the value of a taxi medallion, as many of you might know, has fallen by over 30%. He's not the only person in the United States to have made a leveraged bet of this kind. Perhaps some of you have heard of the housing bust. Perhaps some of you lived through it uh, in your own way. But, you know, we might forget that the housing bust was, was this, you know, brilliant idea. Gosh, let's see to it that people have assets assets, because even if their labor market position deteriorates, if they own a valuable asset that appreciations value over time, that can be a reliable source of wealth for them, for their retirement, for their children's education, and much else. The trouble is that, you know, those assets aren't guaranteed to increase in value. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one upward mobility strategy that, of course, has, has a downside. Uh, there's another gentleman I encountered, a guy um, of Afro-Caribbean origin, uh, who is in his 50s, who's actually taken on a very physically strenuous job. 
uh, what he's done is after you know spending many years in not very stable jobs, working as an orderly and much else, he finally achieved a, a goal that he'd had for a long time. He'd been on a waiting list for literally years and years to become what is known as a sand hog. These are guys who operate these very complicated tunneling machines uh, in New York City. And, and these are actually very lucrative jobs. Uh, now, the barrier is that these jobs are controlled by a local union uh, that has very few members, but once you join the club, once you enter the club, then you know, you're, you're pretty much set. So you know, this was something that he was very happy about and he was looking forward to many more years of remunerative employment, but of course not everyone can become a sand hog. Not everyone has that time to wait. Uh, and of course, you know, he's starting this job in his early 50s, so he's not necessarily gonna enjoy a long career doing this kind of work. And the other issue is that because sand hogs are so expensive in New York City, it's related to the fact that tunnels are really expensive in New York City, which is why it's really hard to build subways to help lots of working class folks uh, in neighborhoods like East Flatbush, Flatlands, et cetera, you know, get to work. So, you know, it's, it's a tricky issue, right? Some people win that lottery, other people don't. Um, and then finally, there's a gentleman that I met, not an immigrant, unlike the first two, um, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and he's a guy who had moved from Memphis, uh, and he was, you know, just driving a car. But what he did is he came up with this complicated system of bribes, where he would basically give a cash kickback uh, to the owners of various hotels and other locations around town. Uh, to be sure that he was the first one to get their calls whenever they had a client who needed to get to the airport. But of course, he couldn't handle all the business himself, so he brought his nephew from South Florida, who was working at a theme park making just over minimum wage, and then he also brought his brother. Uh, and also, he'd, he was paying a network uh, of guys from Central America and elsewhere uh, his kickbacks uh, to be part of this network so that he was always the first guy who got called. Now, I bring these three examples up because they actually speak to social isolation in complicated ways. These are all people uh, who've kind of learned valuable on-the-job skills, but they've actually responded to rapid economic change in really, really different ways. And I think this is actually very relevant to the education discussion. So when we're talking about apprenticeships, for example, both Bob and Tamar both address this, this notion that, well, we've traditionally thought of apprenticeships as bad because they don't allow you to be resilient resilient in the face of economic change. Uh, well, in fact, it could be that a liberal arts education doesn't make you resilient in the face of economic change either, right? Uh, for example, Andrew mentioned the fact that when you're looking at the bottom 20th of college graduates, they're not making much more than high school graduates. When you look at these differences across majors, one wonders if these differences across majors are actually masking other differences uh, in the nature of your mutual support network. You know, why do you have so many uh, people from less affluent families who fail to flourish uh, in higher education? A big part of it, and this is well understood, is that they actually don't have parents, for example, who can help them navigate. They rely on college advising that is oftentimes uh, extremely substandard. They don't have uh, peers who actually understand how to work the system, uh, to put it crudely. Um, and I think that when you're looking at apprenticeships, you know, this is a universe where what you're doing is you're connecting people to the world of employment, where people can learn about tacit rules, not just formal instruction. This also relates to another issue that Andrew raised, uh, which is the fact that you, know, you have a lot of unreliable information that people are getting access to, including more affluent people. Now, if you're a more affluent person with college-educated parents, you're able to actually distinguish between reliable and unreliable information. Uh, and the reason why you know, the work that Caroline Hoxby and her collaborators have done is so valuable is because, look, they're providing you with trusted, reliable information. But the way that most middle-income people get trusted, reliable information is through their peers. And that's something that I think that we're failing to do because, again, even if you think about college advising, the question is, what are the incentives to be an honest broker? Even if you create, for example, penalties, one brilliant idea that Andrew has raised is the idea that perhaps uh, colleges and universities should be penalized when they graduate students with high degrees of debt uh, on which they default. And I think that that's something that could have a very powerful effect on the incentives, even if the punishment, even if the penalty is not actually that great. But the thing is that even then, uh, you know, presumably there's going to be some way for an institution that is a profit-seeking institution, by the way, whether or not it's formally non-profit or for-profit, but a fundamentally profit-seeking institution to actually game that system and not share that valuable tacit knowledge, because doing that actually is very labor-intensive. The people who are going to provide that information are people who are invested in you, invested in your life. Uh, and this leads me to, uh, to Ron's remarks. Now, when we're talking about the success sequence, and Ron has, um, you know, raised this possibility, but the chief objection to the idea of the success sequence is that it 
it's unrealistic and doesn't appreciate, it doesn't reflect the fact that, look, when you're talking about women uh, raised in low-income households, the men who are the partners available to them are not necessarily men for whom, even if they were to marry them, would be desirable partners, partly because their labor market position has deteriorated. That's a story that we're all familiar with. It's also a story that, you know, we can do, we have policy tools that can solve that problem, or at least mitigate that problem. For example, more generous wage subsidies uh, for unmarried men, work supports of various kinds. Those are things that can help with the margin. But there's another dimension to this lack of marriageable males that we hear so often about, um, which are the behavioral problems. And this raises uh, some very thorny questions about what is the leverage of quote unquote society to discipline the behavior of men who suffer from behavioral problems. There's a wonderful paper from Third Way by David Otter and Melanie Wasserman, and they offer suggestive evidence that when we're looking at the problems facing boys and the problems with uh, the gender gaps in labor markets and education, part of the story is that girls raised in single mother families do much better than boys. So part of what seems to be happening there uh, is that there is a disciplinary issue. Now, as a lot of you guys know, being uh, you know, in the education world, uh, there are actually enormous controversies about school discipline and about discrimination in school discipline, how those tools are being used. And that's actually the really sad thing. The tools that educators and administrators have are basically punitive tools at that level. And then, you know, by the time that these, uh, these boys become young men, then the tools of society at large are also disciplinary tools, uh, but you know, then you're getting into the criminal justice system. And so the question is, you know, how can discipline be used more constructively, uh, you know, as a way to actually help people form these mutual support networks? These are questions that I can't really answer, but I actually really do think that this is totally central. There's some really interesting work, I'll, I'll end on this, by Elizabeth Ananut and some of her uh, collaborators uh, uh, on racial wage gaps as they manifest across different metropolitan areas in the United States. And one really interesting thing she's found is that the racial wage gaps are actually much bigger in the biggest US cities than they are in smaller US cities. So the racial wage gap in the San Francisco Bay Area between uh, blacks and whites is actually much bigger than it is in Oklahoma City. Now, why would that be the case? One thing that we also know is that your productivity raises, uh, rises more quickly in bigger metropolitan areas. That tends to be where you can find uh, you know, a richer array of job opportunities and whatever else. What exactly is going on here? Well, the story that these researchers tell is that it's because our networks tend to be bounded by race. And so if I'm in a bigger city, let's say the white social network is going to be much larger and it's going to give me more opportunity to various uh, economic and educational opportunities than the black social network. So, you know, basically, when you're looking at all of these different educational uh, solutions, you know, part of me wonders about the extent to which some of the outcomes that we're seeing are, are actually reflecting this confounding variable, which is the thickness uh, and the way that these social networks can help you succeed. You know, when I mentioned this gentleman who became a sandhog, he now has a mutual support network of other people who've managed to acquire the same scarce good. Uh, the guy who bought this taxi medallion is someone who was, frankly, slaving away for so much of his life uh, that he was not in a position to cultivate many of those connections. Uh, and so he bought, he did all of the right things, married, working hard, working long hours, etc. you know, but he simply made a bad bet. Whereas that last gentleman, the guy who actually had the least in the way of formal education, uh, the person who uh, is really hustling, what he's doing is having moved from one city to another, he's actually building a network. Now he's doing it by giving people bribes, that's true, but he's certainly aware of the fact that the way that opportunities are going to come to him is by building this kind of network that is going to be a lot more robust. And I think that that's something that, you know, we in the policy world need to think about. Wow. Right. You know, they, they often say that, uh, you know, it, you, we can listen, uh, you know, a lot uh, faster than we can read. In Rehan's case, that may not be the case. That was amazing. I think uh, I have a great idea for National Review. You should do a podcast where you read the whole magazine in 20 minutes or less. Uh, I'll challenge you. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, a lot to unpack. Uh, we are going to go a little bit late on this panel because that's actually the fullest panel we have with four papers presented. So we'll catch up as the day goes on. Uh, a couple of thoughts. First of all, it's clear, I, what I'm hearing from everybody, is it's still a really good idea to try to get as many kids as possible uh, college and career ready you know, by the time that they are 18. That certainly, we, somebody said, we're not letting the K-12 system off the hook. That uh, all of these pathways we've talked about that are, that are really exciting pathways require kids to come in with high levels of skills. 
Uh, so we haven't uh, figured out a way to say, well, we don't really have to worry about that anymore. In fact, we still do have to worry about getting kids to those high levels of skills. Uh, we also need to worry about these issues around personal responsibility. Uh, and as we heard that, uh, especially around issues on parenting, but also some of the behavioral things. And we will talk about that certainly in the next panel and throughout the day. Uh, people talk about non-cognitive skills or character traits or behavior, discipline, that whole bundle of stuff. How are we going to help make sure that when people are 18 to 24 that they're uh, most likely to make uh, good decisions for themselves, avoid early childhood, become, quote, marriageable men, etc. cetera. Um, so lo lots of things to unpack. L let me ask you a question um, first about kids who are not college ready when they're 18. Um, it still seems that a lot of these kids, especially low-income kids, are ending up going to college anyways, ending up in remedial education on community uh, college campuses or sometimes in these for-profit uh, institutions where uh, the success rates are, are terrible also. So if we can agree that, that those kids, well, first of all, let me ask this question. Do we agree that it would be a, a good thing if we could encourage a lot of those kids, particularly those who are nowhere near college ready, right? They're not just a little bit under college ready. They're reading and doing math at a middle school level. Uh, they are not anywhere near college ready. Would it be a good idea if we tried to encourage those kids to do something else? What is that something else that they should be doing when they're 18 or 19 and find themselves in that situation? And, but, and why is it? Why is it that so many of them are choosing to go into remedial education anyway? Any thoughts on that? Uh, that, I, yes, uh, we disagree with that uh, point. No, uh, let's see if... That, that's late, even to get for... Hold on, let's see if he's, uh, he's working his magic back there. This is Spinal Tap. No, okay. Good. Yeah, good. Yeah, technical education. <laughs> um, my, my point is that, that if you wait until kids are 18 or 19, that's very late. You know, first of all, they haven't learned the skills that you're going to need to do some of these technical things, but you've also kind of lost them as people striving in their lives. Right. right? I mean, by the time you get to an 18 or 19 year old who's failed all his life, he's in pretty bad shape. Right, and, and, and I don't disagree that it's late. I don't know if people could hear, as Tamar was saying, you know, it's too late at 18 or 19. And we're going to talk about that throughout the day. How do we start earlier to keep, make sure fewer kids find themselves in this situation? Okay, but my argument is, for the foreseeable future, we're still going to have a lot of 18 or 19 year olds finding them in, themselves in this situation, right? Which is that uh, they are not actually ready for college. And so my question again is, if they shouldn't be going to college, what else should they be doing? And why are they going to college anyways? Um, so a, a couple things. One, um, first, to reiterate a point I made and that I write about in the paper, one of the things we have to do a better job of is helping people diagnose their academic needs before they show up on a college campus and get thrust in front of a placement exam that they have no idea the stakes, the, the, the stakes of. Um, and that allows us to do a couple things. One is to diagnose the, the students that are just on the edge of being college ready and they can maybe take some low cost, sort of quick modular coursework to get caught up. The other is for the folks that test really low and are not college ready, uh, work with them to find an option that's a good one for them, whether that's an apprenticeship like Bob described, whether that's some of these uh, shorter form technical course, uh, courses like, like Tamar described. Um, I do think that we need to, um, we need to have sort of a reality check. And, and I would say, I think Ron's work on the success sequence is very compelling, but I also want to just um, uh, point out that there seems to be sometimes a yearning for um, simpler times, right? When a high school diploma uh, what could get you to the middle class when the economy was structured such that that was true. Um, and, and I think we need to be clear that the data suggests that it's really hard these days to make it um, with a high school diploma without any further post-secondary training. And the question is, what does that look like and how should we pay for it um, as, w as well? Should it be Pell Grants? Should it be other things? So, I mean, is part of the situation, Andrew, that simply the incentives of the colleges are that if, if kids enroll in remedial education, they can get paid, and there's not money for them to do some of these other routes. Well, yeah, I, th I, th yeah I think that's part of it. I think part of it's that colleges, um, co community colleges were created with a mandate from the state to be open access. Uh, if you have a high school diploma and you show up, 
They, base, they essentially have to enroll you, right? Um, if you if a for-profit college will call you and convince you to enroll um, and then have to take you know so, so a bunch of remedial work that is paid for by by Pell um, so that's part of the problem certainly there's a su supply side problem but um, but I think uh, you know it's also about thinking through um, um, what we require for different programs so do you really need to be um, do you really need to meet the same proficiency level in math and reading if you're going to go into a, a, a technical um, uh, credential um, like Tamar described or not? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think part of the problem is the supply side, or you want to say the demand side for workers. Um, we don't have enough slots uh, in the case of apprenticeship. Uh, but what's striking is, and people have noted this for a long time, ever since the forgotten half and before that, that almost all of our investment in post-secondary is, is for academic only approaches, for college approaches. And we spend billions and tens of billions of dollars on that. I mean, Pell Grants alone are like 35 billion. And the Office of Apprenticeship to promote apprenticeship is about, is 30 million, 30 million. If we spent the same amount that the British spend, England, England spends on apprenticeship, given the differential size, we'd be spending 10 billion on apprenticeship, which isn't all that much compared to what we're spending on the college uh, basis. Now, so I, I'm of two minds in this. On the one hand, yes, I would encourage people to look for apprenticeships. On the other hand, the fact that we have such a scarcity of them makes me realize at the current time mm -hmm. that's not the full solution. At the current time, the solution requires policy initiatives uh, that expand the role of apprenticeship uh, in the economy. And, and that would allow uh, some the, the Pell Grants or the right. other higher education aid to be used for those sorts of programs, uh, as and, and as well as for the credentials, right? I mean, can they be used for these other credentialing programs yeah, tomorrow? Yeah, so How does that Pell rules are really complicated, but you have to go to a school that's accredited, mm -hmm. and you have to take a certain number of hours of class time, mm -hmm. and you have to be in certain kinds of programs, so it's very complicated, but it basically means I can use my Pell Grant to learn history at community college, I can use my Pell Grant to learn welding at community mm -hmm. college, but the chances are that if the, if the community college isn't working with an employer, he's teaching old-fashioned welding that doesn't get you a job, mm -hmm. and I can't go to the trade association welding program that isn't accredited and learn welding, which is the really good one. Right. And that community college is not necessarily telling you that, you know, if you want the, to go take this credential route, you don't need to take remedial English. Right. Uh, but they should. Right. They could. Right. right. Okay. Interesting. I just have a quick question for, for Bob or Tamar. It's a very obvious one, but I mean, is the chief reason that the private sector doesn't take on this burden itself is that their anxiety is that they won't be able to capture the value of the investment in human capital? So that's a really complicated question, too. I mean, in some sectors, employers are st stepping up more, but you don't actually want, as a society, for it only to be employers training for jobs. I mean, that's where Bob sort of has a point. You want to be training people for careers. And so you do have a lot of employers training people for these industry-recognized credentials, and that's the best, because then they're just not training them to do, you know, a few weeks to do my job at my factory. They're training them in the skills to be a machinist. So you, if you create the credentials, that helps employers step up and you and it gives them a, gives the kids a better training well I'm an economist and I always hear the comment about apprenticeship where's the market failure why isn't it happening? if it's so great why isn't it happening uh, my answer is that apprenticeship works in practice but maybe not in theory and <laughs> why you why do I say that because you've seen cases I see cases not not one company, but where when you try to expand apprenticeship and you make a good faith effort to do so, employers pick it up. Otherwise, how do you explain the fact that in 2007, in South Carolina, 90 companies had registered apprenticeships. In 2013, 700 did, with a staff of about six people selling apprenticeship and a tax credit of $1,000 per apprentice per year. How do you explain the fact that England had 150,000, 
employers providing 150,000 apprenticeships in 2007, and something like seven or 800,000, of which, say, five, 500,000 are good ones, uh, doing that. Well, it does take a combination of information, sales, marketing, um, helping companies realize that these can be good investments. Um, companies are worried about a lot of things, where their sales are coming from, who they should buy their inputs from, where they should locate. You know, they're, you know the, the managers of these companies are worried about a lot of things. Right, so but, this, one, one more point, which is that companies also in their accounting systems don't really capture the gain in human capital. So it doesn't look like it's an asset on their balance sheet to have a highly trained workforce. Now, many companies know it anyway and do it, but it doesn't show up in their accounting system and many, too many companies look at it that way. I'm sorry. All right. I, I'm, it certainly seems to me, and it, it made a compelling case, that we're, uh, some of this investment that we're putting into traditional higher education, especially in remedial education, if we could figure out a way to move that instead to these more productive routes, uh, Here, we would Here's a off. point primarily for the K-12 educators. Going back to your original question, you got a kid to 18, 19, he can't add, he doesn't know anything about algebra, he can't read very well, right. he's at the middle school level. The fact is, he's screwed. <laughs> and yeah. we are showing that that's one of the main features of these papers, that even apprenticeships, mm -hmm. which a lot of people think of as, oh, well, you don't need to be able to read even, mm -hmm. you know, you can get an apprenticeship and work on a machine, you'll be, get rich. Right. No. They're all moving in the direction of more and more and more technical, more and more and more education. So K-12 folks, if they don't do the job, yeah. a lot of kids are really out of luck. And indeed, we have a lot of kids like that that are out of luck. Yeah. Some of them make up for it, but a lot of them can't. Right. Yeah, let's so let, let's keep talking. Mind. Hold on. Let me, I, I want to keep on that a little bit and, and understand. So back to my original example at the beginning, though. Say that, that kid, though goes out, gets a low-wage, low-skilled job, but does well. I mean, shows up for work, you know. Uh, I mean, so the question is, am I being naive about that? I mean, does, I mean, that is part of the success sequence, yeah, right? But is, it, is to show up and to work full-time. Yes, he's better off doing that than lying around the neighborhood or whatever else he's gonna do. But the, but, but the big point about that how, how education and society is changing is a return to skills is true for people with academic college degrees, but it's also true in this middle tier. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the credential I focused on, just because it's one of the kind of rising ones, is preci precision machinist mm -hmm. in advanced manufacturing. Well, to be a precision machinist, you need to understand sines and cosines and tangents. Right. I mean, never mind math, you know, adding, uh, you know, fractions signs and cosines and tangents. I mean, your kid who's working, he's, if he's not going to learn that somewhere, it's going to be hard for him to get into that precision machinist certification course. Uh, I was okay. recently in Wisconsin and in a session devoted to, with the legislature and everything, and it was devoted to this group of kids and how are they going to get employment, okay? And they had several uh, company owners there. One of them owned a company that specialized in welding. And he went on and on about, if I could find welders, I could double my profits. I can't find welders and so forth. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, describe to me what you mean by a welder. Because I thought it was a guy that had a flame and, you know, melting something. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow, I could not believe the stuff he described to me that those welders had to do. I mean, they really had to be extremely highly skilled. And I said to him, do you fire a lot of welders? He said, yep. Right. We, we hire them, we think we're going to be able to make a good wild arm, we can't. So right. back to your point. But, Tomorrow, the last but, word. But the one thing I have seen is I've seen a lot of kids who are like 16, who, they, who the, get to the welding program kind of two years before the end of high school and suddenly get interested in math and learn it really, you know, learn enough pretty fast. But once they're, you know, if there's, once they're out, it's harder. Yeah. But there is, I think, a moment, you know, in, in junior high, middle school, um, in that middle of high school where if they get the bug of wanting to, you know, I can do this and it's right. fun and I want to learn in order to do it, you can turn them around. Well, that is a perfect segue to our next panel, which is going to get into what happens at the high school level then to prepare uh, kids for success later on. 
We are going to take just a 10-minute break because we need to start catching up a little bit. So we will be back at 1040, but get some coffee. Please join me in thanking this great first panel of ours.